go live. Hi, everybody. Welcome to PMP Live. My name is Michelle, and I'm a bookseller with the Children and Teens Department. Thank you for joining us tonight in this newer format where we continue to bring you politics and prose author events, but from the comfort of your own home. At any time during or after the event, you can click the green and buy the book button to get your own copy of American Royals. You can select shipping or curbside pickup. We even have signed book plates from Catherine McGee and Jenny Lee, which will come with your purchase while supplies last. Recently released in paperback, American Royals would be a great summer read at the beach or a fun gift for a friend, so just keep that in mind. Tonight, you can ask the authors questions by clicking to ask a question located at the bottom of your screen. You can also vote on your favorite questions, and at the end, we'll have time to go over some together. As always, please remember this is a creative, safe space, and we ask that folks be respectful of one another and any questions and comments. Also, don't worry about turning off your webcam or your mic for our event. You can see us, but we cannot see you. So feel free just to sit back and enjoy. Now on to tonight's event. It is my pleasure to introduce Catherine McGee, who is joined in conversation with Jenny Lee. Catherine is the New York Times bestselling author of the Thousand Floor series. This YA, these YA sci-fi novels reimagined Manhattan beginning in 2118. She studied French and English literature at Princeton and has an MBA from Stanford. Intrigued by the idea of American royalty, she began a fun new series, American Royals, which follows an alternate reality for our country. In the first installment, readers are introduced to the heir to the throne, Beatrice, and her twin siblings, Samantha and Jeff, and all of their daily adventures and love triangles. Full of glamour, romance, and drama, the series will continue this fall when the sequel comes out. Jenny is a television writer and producer. She's worked on several shows, including BET's Boomerang and Disney Channel's Shake It Up. She's written humor essay novels, or I'm sorry, collections and middle grade novels. This past March, Jenny made her YA debut with Anna Kay, A Love Story. A clever retelling, yep, of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina has become a national indie bestseller. And now I'll turn the conversation over to Catherine and Jenny. Thanks all. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jenny Lee, as she said, author of Anna Kay, and I'm super excited to be able to host this event and talk to Catherine, who we met because my editor at Flatiron Books for Anna Kay was worked with Catherine, and so when we were looking for blurb, she's like, I think this will be right up Catherine's alley, You had a, I've got to send it to her, and then I immediately bought American Royals because I wanted to read it and was like completely into it, so I was super thrilled when she gave me a great blurb for my book, and then what? We met in person in We Dallas. met in person. Well, first I stalked Jenny online because I love her book so much. So I, I mean, blurbing books is always fun, but it's it's rare that I get asked to blurb a book and I read the entire thing in one sitting and basically cannot put it down. Uh, Anna Kay is amazing. And if you have not checked it out, I highly, highly recommend it. It's so much fun and full of you know, high stakes glamour and romance and lots of drama and um, and a lot of very thoughtful conversations about the way the world is and how the world can be better. So I was so delighted to read it that I asked, and I knew Jenny lived in LA, so I asked Sarah, Jenny's editor, if she could connect us by email. And then we emailed for a while and then we missed each other. I was in LA in November, but Jenny was in New York. So we, we passed like ships in the night, but then we got to meet in Irving at Texas Teen Book Festival this spring, which was really fun. So I'm glad we finally got to meet in person. Yes, we met right before <laughs> pandemic started, basically, the week before. before. It was the last conference that made it in before the pandemic, truly. Right, right. Because I had other, we were going to see each other in Houston at another book festival. In we April. were going to see each other in Houston. I was going to take Jenny out for fajitas and nachos, but we'll just have to do it at a later date. We'll have to do it at a later date. Um, I do want everyone to know that Catherine and I did have a discussion about whether today was the right time to do this particular event, mm -hmm. given like what's going on um, out in the world right now, because obviously we both show our support to the cause and the protests. And, you know, so we wanted to just make sure that we were being respectful of this time. And, you know, maybe it's not the best time for, you know, self-promotion of our books, et cetera. But then we really discussed it. We discussed it with the bookstore and we decided that, you know, there were so many people that RSVP'd and we thank you all for joining us that we thought, you know, we really wanted to have just an author to author discussion. 
about writers and our books and, you know, it's a safe space and we just wanted to go ahead and, you know, do that for the fans and the readers out there. So that's what Absolutely. we Absolutely. And if we, there are so many fun events coming up at Politics and Prose. If we were going to reschedule, we would have had to wait a long time. And I was very anxious to, to hang digitally with Jenny. So, so we're here tonight. Yeah. This will basically be just her and I like ha so happy to see another person as opposed to just my husband and my daughter. Okay, so yes. let's start it. I just want everyone to know I had read the book in the galley form and then I got the hardcover, but I was refreshing before this because I'm a nerd and I have to like think about my questions, but I got the audio book of American Royals and it's been, it, it was great. I really liked the audio book. I thought it was super fun and it just made me get all excited about it again and get ready for the sequel, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so first, I want to hear a little bit more about the genesis for the idea of the book, because I'm always so interested. It's like, how did you come up with this idea? And tell us a little bit about it. Yes, so I've always been a reader of historical fiction. I actually, as a consumer, I probably read, I read more than half of what I read is historical fiction. I read a lot of Philip Gregory. Um, I have long lists if anyone wants to read uh, hear them. But uh, Sandra Galland, Susan Holloway Scott, all, a lot of books that are set in Tudor England or Versailles or the Romanovs, and I just find that you know that type of story so fascinating. I think for several reasons, it is at the end of the day, you know, a story usually about family dynamics and and love, but it's playing out with these much greater stakes, which is a feeling that we always try to capture in young adult literature because when you're a young adult, everything feels like the most stakeful thing in the world and you must find true love or the world will end. And so in a story about royalty, you know, your, your true love might end up affecting a dynasty or uh, relations between two con countries who are at war. And so everything just feels, you know, so much bigger and more epic and I, I, so that's all, you know, that, that has always appealed to me. And then of course there's this idea of fate because royals are some of the last people in the world who are truly subject to destiny. I think obviously one of the best things about writing contemporary fiction is that you aren't writing a novel where people are hemmed in by how they were born or, or what they identify as, but if you're a royal, you kind of are one of these, this small group of people whose job is actually defined for you by the family you were born into. And of course, none of us are gonna sit around feeling sorry for them, but you know, they have wonderful lives, but you can't deny that, that there are a lot of options that aren't open to them because of who they are. And so I, I find that idea of you know, destiny very, very fun and fulfilling, and it's not something that you can do in, in a modern story except in a few places. So I've always wanted, and I've always circled the royal space. And like I said, loved, you know, loved everything about the Tudors and castles. And I'm very much um, a Francophile and Anglophile and always thought that I was going to write some kind of historical fiction about Marie Antoinette or something. And then I was living in New York and actually used to work in book publishing. So I was an editor of young adult novels for almost four years which is when I got to know uh, Jenny's editor, Sarah, who's wonderful. And I, so that was the year in uh, 2011, it was the year that the Cambridges, uh, Prince William and Duchess Kate got married. And I remember walking to work that morning. Well, actually I really, to tell the full story, I went to a royal wedding party with a friend and keep in mind that this was happening in New York time. So the party started at 6 a.m. And it was on Friday because royals get married on weekdays because then everyone in the country gets a bank holiday and it's really fun. Sure. So I was at a party from 6 a.m. to about 8.30. And we had mimosas and, um, and ate croissants or something and, and watched the royal wedding and we all wore hats and it was so much fun. And then I walked to work afterwards and felt very tired the rest of the day. I've never in my life before since gone to a 6 a.m. party. That's a very, very unique circumstance. But it was so much fun. And and as I was walking to work, I felt like everybody was engaged in the royal wedding. People were listening to it on the radio. It was playing on the big screens in Times Square. And the when the newlyweds kissed, everybody in New York was applauding. And I couldn't help but wonder, you know, why we were so fascinated 
by the royals when they didn't belong to us. And of course, if you ask a British person, most of my British friends will just roll their eyes and say like, of course, you know, you love them because your taxes don't support them. So right. <laughs> they're great entertainment for you, but we pay for them. So, you know, we do kind of have a, a degree of distance from them that I think makes it a little bit easier to love them without complications. And, uh, and so it just got me to wondering, you know, we, we don't have royals and how would the world look different if we did? And that led me slowly into this world of American royals. So this is actually the first concept that I ever tried to write. I worked on it before I worked on my first series and I just couldn't quite figure out the right way to execute it. And so I set it aside and then entered this different sci-fi space for the Thousand of Four, which is my first trilogy, but I could not let go of American Royals, so right. I was very excited to come back to it and, and kind of tackle it again a couple of years ago. Great, um, that kind of leads into my next question, which is that I, you know, I joined Instagram or Bookstagram um, for Anna Kay, so like a year ago, so I'm kind of new at it, and it's just opened up this whole world and terms, and I've done a lot of virtual events, but one question, I kept, the first time someone asked me, I'm like, I don't know what either of those things are, because the question is always, are you a pantser or a plotter? And though obviously as an author, I understand what plot is, so I was like, okay, but I didn't know that pantser is like fly by the seat of your pants. So when you're writing, do you just like sit down and you have this idea, because you talked about um, you trying to crack it because I had a similar thing with Anna Kay like I had the idea in 2012 But I couldn't figure out how to do it. So it takes a while to like, mull, you know, mull around in your brain So tell us how you then cracked it I know and Jenny I want you to answer this question too afterwards because I really am so curious how Anna Kay 1 is differing from Anna Kay 2 <laughs> because you you like sort of followed Anna Karenina, but you uh, you obviously, you know, you, you changed the story in ways that suited you, but now you're operating with a blank slate. So I'm sure it's a completely different animal. So yeah, I'd love to hear about that. For American Royals, I for all my books so far, I'm very much of a plotter. My books are all multi-POV, as are Jenny's. <laughs> so they're, you know, they're different chapters who are narrated by different characters. In American Royals, four different young women each take turns telling the story. And so I'm essentially following four different storylines at once and keeping track of all the ways that those stories intersect. And it, when something happens to one character, it obviously impacts all of the others. So, and inherently when you're creating conflict in a story, often that means that characters are in opposition to each other. So something that is a victory for one character. So for instance, Nina getting romance with Jefferson in American Royals um, ends up being a loss or a setback for another character, especially if you set up a love triangle like I did with, with Nina and Jeff and Daphne, except it turns into kind of a love quadrangle because you've got Ethan on the side. <laughs> I have a lot of messy love relationships. So I track them very carefully. I actually have a whiteboard in my office. You're seeing the pretty part of my office. This is. <laughs> Like, this is the artwork wall behind me, and then I'm actually looking at the scribbly whiteboard wall that's covered, and you can't see that because it's covered in spoilers for it, something else. But um, I, I do, I, I write down the whiteboard, I color code, I put things in a wow. document and, and shuffle them around, and then I, I always have a chapter outline before I start writing. But inevitably, it falls apart somewhere along the way, and I have to reorder things and get back on the whiteboard and fix it. But I am so impressed by pantsers because I don't know how they, I don't, I don't know how that kind of process would work. I'm so intimidated by the blank page. The only way I can fill up a blank page with words is that I have an outline and I know loosely where the story is going. So yeah, so how is Anna K2 different from Anna K1? Well, I mean, I'm a total pantser. Even with Anna K, <laughs> it was much easier to be a pantser than because I had certain plot points I was going to hit. But really part one of my book is a lot of Anna Karenina, like pretty identical to the mm -hmm. opening of Anna Karenina. But then I start to deviate, you know, and I'll do like little Easter eggs. But other than that, I kind of just let it happen what happened. And I would, I did track it. I didn't outline, which made my husband crazy. I think because I worked in television mm -hmm. for so long with multiple characters, I was able to understand that you got to like cross them. It's been much more difficult for book two, I have to say, which I just finished. Oh. It's such a delight for me to talk to other authors who write multi POV because there are far fewer like single POV books are I don't have a statistic, but I would guess they're what do you think like 70% more? I mean, right. most, most books seem to be narrated 
whether they're in first person or third person by a single character. And so we are definitely the exception rather than the norm. And I think we, our brains operate in like a, a very funny way where I, I think it would be very hard to write a book from one person's point of view the whole time. I would personally get bored. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Every time I read the chapter, I'm so excited to get to the next character. I'm, I'm done with you, and I'm ready for someone new. So I'm constantly needing the refreshing change of voices just to kind of keep my pace going. I know. I've always loved multiple POV too, because for me, my first way into a book or story, it's all about the character. Like you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Redeemable, not redeemable, protagonist, antagonist, like the villain or whatnot. I all I care about are like the people in the story more than like necessarily the plot. Like if you can win me over with the emotion of the characters, I'm in. So, um, all right. So now we're, we have Panzer versus the plotter. So let's see. Okay. Um, my next question is, is that you had incredible female characters that are all complicated and fascinating. Speaking of, since you had four, you had four female characters that, that they rotate between. We have Beatrice. We have Sam, who's her younger sister, who's also a twin. Nina Gonzalez, um, who's Sam's civilian best friend. And then, oh, civilian was in quotes, not best friend. <laughs> um, <laughs> then we also have Daphne, who was a really fun villain. Like, I kind of like you feel for her because of her mom. So I want you to tell me, like, who's sort of like the most fun character for you to write, which is different than your favorite character to write. I know. They all are fun at different moments. So for me, it's less. Uh, it's less that there's one character who's purely the most fun the whole time. And it's more, um, you know, when I'm outlining, I already know at the beginning, which scenes are going to be my favorites to write. And I still write in order, but I, you know, it's any shockingly, anything romantic, um, any of the, the big dramatic scenes where something impactful is happening. Those tend to come to me very easily. I actually find, the what I call the building block scenes much harder. So when when I'm writing dialogue, if the dialogue is building towards something, if two characters are fighting or breaking up or you know deciding that they're going to share a secret or something like that, it it comes very easily. And it's the little chapters that I've outlined without a lot of detail. For instance, you know, Nina and Jeff go on a date and Nina realizes that she likes him more or you know, softening between two characters who used to be enemies. And then I don't actually know what that looks like until I sit down to write it. I find those scenes really tricky because I, I don't, you know, you have to actually sit there with the page and with the characters and think about, you know, what are you guys doing in this scene and how are you going to think about each other? And are we going to have a flashback to the first time you interacted? So, so it tends to be less, a character base that said um, there are characters who tend to have more of those scenes than others of, of the easier kind to write Daphne is usually my easiest character because her motivations are so clear and every single one of her scenes is always driving towards a goal so I never really have to worry about her I never have to sit with her and question what does she want and and how far is she willing to go to get what she wants because that's she wants to be a princess and she's willing to do anything and right. so it, you know, there so that's that's easy um and like i said they the, yeah the, all, each of them has really really fun scenes in each of the books i will say i'm probably the most similar to beatrice she's probably the easiest to relate to only because i'm also an oldest child i also have a younger brother and a younger sister and my, my relationship with my siblings is not quite as turbulent as hers is, but they are, they're the rule breakers and I'm the rule follower. I'm the one who always tries to keep the peace and keep my parents happy. And they, they're the younger siblings. So they, you know, the rules are a little different for them. So right. I, I do feel like some of that made way into Beatrice. Right. I'm the youngest child. So it's like, the most likely to be a rebel or revolutionary because I was like, oh, my brother went to Harvard. I don't have to. I want to go to art school. Yeah. So it's like it gives yeah. you a chance. But I do always, I felt for Beatrice too. She had so much pressure that she just couldn't talk to. I mean, I found her, you know, times of like feeling very isolated. Like it's hard to complain when I'm going to be the next queen of America. So it's like this tricky thing, but I really felt for her in that position because like she just had like a huge weight of like, what it all meant for her. So I found, you know, I really thought it was very also heartwarming about her relationship with Sam, which is very tricky because 
that middle child, Sam, you know, can we talk a little bit about the Sam and Beatrice like dynamic? Cause I found it so, and I thought you handled it very movingly and beautifully. Like it really like kind of this like little eeks and jumps, which I like. Thank you. Yeah, like I said, I my sister and I don't fight like that. So that really required a lot of imagination, but you know, I, I had to kind of think about about what it would feel like if you had grown up with a sibling whose life was so similar to yours in so many ways. And, and in many ways, you know, you're the only two people who understand this strange world that you're living in. You know, it, it really is inaccessible to outsiders. Even Nina, who's grown up alongside it, often struggles to, to, to get, you know, all the restrictions and all of the nuances of, you know, what this royal world entails for Sam. And so in many ways, it should be Beatrice and Sam against the world because they're the only two people who, who truly know what it's like but their lives are definitionally so very different because Beatrice is the one who's set up to inherit everything and, and to matter. And Sam is just kind of the other one. So that, that required, you know, a little bit of imagination, but, um, but of course when you're writing, uh, part of what you're doing is drawing on emotions that you really have had or, and then, and then heightening them or finding ways to transpose them onto your characters. So obviously when you're writing, a scene where two characters fight, even if you're not writing about a fight that you had with your sister, you're thinking of a time that some other fight made you sad or something else bothered you and you're putting that, you're drawing on that experience and emotion to to fuel the scene. So I'm sure there are moments in my life that I can't think of off the top of my head that have like made their way into the books, you know, through, through that dynamic. Um, but like I said, I'm, I'm lucky that my sister and I get along very well and she's very she loves to say that she is Sam right which like there are the elements of her in Sam but she is she is not Sam but she that's been her her way of like talking about the book with her friends is you should read this book because I'm in it and I'm Samantha and I just let her have that shorthand if it makes her happy but it's there's it's she's probably you know 20 percent of Samantha but there's a lot in there that's invented but Sam is sort of fun because when I was thinking about one of my questions, like, was, are you, who would you kind of pick to be? Because I was like, when I think about it, like, Sam kind of, you're like, you get a lot of the perks, but not all the responsibility. So you kind of understand why a, you know, that she seems like a, like, she's the Pippa. She'd be kind of fun, but like, you know. Oh, I'd much rather be the Pippa. I, I wouldn't even want to be Harry. I wouldn't even want to be... Edward, I want to be like 58th in line for the throne. Right. Like, you've heard of Lady Gabriella Windsor? You probably haven't because right. she's, I don't know, a third cousin once removed. And I only know her because I subscribe now to all these royalty blogs. But so she's just royal enough that when she got married, the queen let her take a tiara from the royal vault and get married in the tiara. And like she gets to go to the parties, but no one really takes her picture or cares about who she is. That's how royal I would like to be. Right. Like, that's where are you all this in your life? Go to William's wedding. Right. Otherwise, I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Um, I'm looking out for the time because also everyone who's out there, we're going to take questions from the audience. So if you have any, now's the time to start uh, typing them in so that we'll see them in a little bit because Michelle's going to come back on. But I have two more questions that I want to get through first. Um, Let's talk about the writing process a little bit, because I really do think, I mean, even through Instagram, I've gotten people who've been like, I so want to write myself. And like, you know, do you have any tips for me? And, you know, I just think that's sort of valuable because I had always wanted to be a writer, like, you know, through high school, you know, art school, etc. So I would that's a question I always wanted to hear about, you know, authors that I admired. So give us. Yeah, I mean, so as I said, I, I take about a year per book. Um, I struggle with this outline first and I, I spend a lot of time on my outline, probably at least a month, if not six weeks back and forth with my agent who is a really good sounding board. I'm lucky that my husband's also a very good sounding board and my sister. These are a very you know, it's a very funny job and it's extremely hard to do in isolation, even though of course it's work that has to be done in isolation. But I think thinking through these things, 
alone. And it's, and you obviously know Jenny from being a TV writer. There's there is value to just talking out story with someone else. So 100%. I really do find it helpful, you know, before I start writing to kind of walk through the plot line with my husband, who's done this enough times. Poor guy. He's he really. I've like ruined storytelling for him. Um, we were recently rewatching Harry Potter, and I think it's in the sixth movie, or maybe the fifth, where Hermione's mad that Ron is with Lavender, and Harry's all down because Ginny's uh, with Dean Thomas. And my husband looks at me and he goes, "Now you know if this was a Catherine McGee novel." Hermione and Harry would just start pretending to date to make their respective people jealous. But then they would discover that they had truth. Then they would kiss and then it would turn into a real kid. And I was just listening to him talk and my, my jaw was just dropping. <laughs> I was like, I've done such terrible work on you. You just see YA romance everywhere now. I'm so sorry. It's so funny. I've ruined you. But um, okay, it really is helpful, I think. And, and I know a lot of aspiring writers who use social media for this, or if particularly Facebook, I think has a lot of writers groups just so you can you know bounce ideas off of people and, and get other eyes on your pages. And then yeah, as far as day to day goes, I don't know. I, I try to write, I try to be at my desk by, I would say 10 or 1030, you know, with my coffee, ready to go. And I don't find that I do any good work if I don't put in at least five or six hours just you know, trying to like, get a good chunk of work done. Of course, sometimes life gets in the way and it doesn't work out like that. But um, but I do think it's it's a hard thing to do in fits and starts. For me, there's very much like a settling in period and then I actually get good work done. And then when I start to feel myself pulling back, um, you know, then I know it's time to end. Of course, then there's times you're on deadline and you're just pounding caffeine and trying to get words on the page. I know you were recently in that stage. I was just, there. I was just like blur of weeks and days. I mean, it's been like that anyway, but like so much copy and just trying to like get to the end. So it was, yeah, I'm all, I'm a, a, I always start a little bit later than I should probably. So I'm definitely like been a procrastinator. You, I don't grow out of it. So apparently, um, let's see. Oh, uh, one thing I wanted to ask since you were an editor, which I think gives you a unique perspective because you've seen it from both sides. Do you have any advice from that side of your brain, which is like, okay, when you're thinking about it, like come up with like a good plot, you know, first, or do you, or do you like look at the business of like what type of book someone would want to write or they're thinking about and they should study it? Or you think it's like all from the heart and come down and just like go with it? I think it's hard to write for the market. I think stories that are written, you know, with a specific audience in mind rarely end up feeling as passionate or authentic as stories that are written for you. So, uh, and I, I think most authors would agree that all of our books are written basically for ourselves. I write books that I would want to read or that teenage me would want to read. And I think, you know, the second that you try to write based on trends that you're seeing, it's just, you're, you're not gonna connect with the material in the same way. And I think it will fall flat. I think the biggest gift that I got from being an editor was honestly seeing other authors' first drafts it can be so intimidating as a reader to see a finished book and and read it, maybe even read it in an afternoon and then think, wow, this is such a perfect finished product. And I don't know if I could ever produce something like this. And it's easy to forget that that represents a year, if not years of labor and the input of many people and many editors. And for me, being on the other side and actually seeing first drafts come in from authors that I loved. You know, I got to edit the Pretty Little Liars books, the, the 100 books by Cass Morgan, um, some really amazing projects and having them come and land on my desk and just seeing how much changes between the first draft and final draft was a huge confidence booster because it got me to realize that I don't need to, to write, you know, this bound perfect book. I just need to write a first draft, which I guess it should be should be obvious, but it's different when you see them and you see exactly you know how much growth happens along the way. 
Yes, I agree a thousand percent. I think it's excellent because sometimes, you know, you're like, oh, there's so many dystopian novels. Maybe I should try one. I've been interested, but I, I just don't think that works out necessarily. You got to write exactly what you said for the, the right time and like what you want to read. And the same thing, like I was always told for TV. All right, last question from me, which is very exciting. The sequel to American Royals is coming out in September and it's called Majesty. Um, can you tell us anything about it? Because you did leave it on a major cliffhanger that was like left it on a major cliffhanger. <laughs> I am very into television and right. love a good dramatic season finale. And I always think of my books that they should end with that level of an emotional gut punch. But I recognize that some people find that uh, somewhat irritating because <laughs> they have to wait a long time for the next book. Right. So yeah, Majesty is currently the end of American Royals. So right now it's only the two books. It's possible that in the future at some point I will revisit the world, but for now uh, the story concludes at the end of Majesty. So you won't be left on such a terrible cliffhanger this time. And it basically picks up in the aftermath of book one, following all the characters. It's more, more of everything you've come to expect from me. So more drama, more romance, more secrets coming to light. Uh, more teens doing things that they shouldn't do. And the world gets a, a bit bigger. You go to some fun new places. I had an especially delightful time writing Royal Los Angeles. So now I'm really excited for you to read it because you can imagine uh, how, how royal it feels. And um, and some some minor characters who made very small appearances in book one become very major to the plot. So I got to sort of expand my cast a little bit too. That's fun. That's great. Excellent. Very excited. It is pre-order time now for Majesty. I love that cover too. I mean, do you have a favorite of the two covers or I know it's hard to pick? I love the cover and I'm so excited that I, so I actually got to pick the title Majesty, which doesn't always happen with sequels and um, and I think it just looks really good and yeah. and Daisy looks amazing and she's looking at you you know face on and she's got her crown on and she just looks really like a really powerful woman. Excellent. Well, I'm super excited. This has been so fun. I think we're gonna bring Michelle back on and we're gonna do some questions from the audience. Hi, all right, I'm back. That was great, guys. Thanks for uh, well giving us a little sneak peek of Majesty. I'm super excited and really grateful to learn that we'll you know be getting some answers, so that'll be fun. And it was good to hear you know which characters you relate to and um, about the writing process. So now, um, viewers, we have time. Um, if you still haven't asked a question, you can add one by clicking "Ask a Question" below at the bottom of your screen. You can also vote on questions there and that'll move them to the top of the list. So we're gonna go through some now and we'll do as many as we have time for. All right. Um, okay, so some of these we might have already covered in your discussion. Um, let's see, but one that Catherine um, is curious about is will, you know, is there a chance the book could be made into a movie? <laughs> I'm very hopeful that there will be an American Royals TV show or movie. So I don't have any concrete news about it, but I have an amazing agent in LA who's hard at work on trying to make it happen. And um, and if there if there is news, I will share it as soon as I can on social. But for now, I'm waiting as anxiously as you guys are. Very cool. Well, thanks for bringing us up to speed on that. Let's see. Erica has this is kind of a fun quirky question. I like this. What would Samantha's Starbucks order be? <laughs> oh wow! I think oh I think Samantha would like in the summer she always gets a frappuccino, like a like, like yeah. extra whipped cream, and um, the rest of the time probably a latte with almond milk. Very nice. Is that what your sister would order too? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Not um, so much the frappuccino. You would bully her into one, but for sure the latte. She's Yes, that is her thing. Very cool. Okay, so someone's asking about favorite story to write, but we already kind of covered that. I think you like the romance or the impactful moment, but I do kind of a, a tweak on that. What um, character do you root for the most? Or what relationship do you find yourself kind of invested in more or rooting for more? Oh, this is gonna not go over well, but <laughs> I have a lot of fun writing Daphne and Ethan. 
Um, I don't know why. It's that it, there's something about the dark undercurrent of them together that I find well, very villains. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they are fun. Um, yeah, well, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in there, but I guess also, you know, you said she's got a clear um, goal pretty much when you go into scenes. It's not super hard to write her or anything, so it must just be a fun fun one to write. Okay, cool. Um, Catherine also wants to know, the whiteboard you mentioned earlier, the whiteboard wall, and you said it had some spoilers. Would that be, um, you know, in regards to American Royals, or are you also working on any other new projects or new series? I'm not yet, I'm working on a new project. I'm not yet working on an American Royals book three, but if I decide to do one, I have I have a loose roadmap of where, what the characters would be up to. It would need a lot of actual whiteboard time, but uh, it's not it's not on the whiteboard yet. I'm working on a new project that is in the really early stages. And it's funny, I, I started working on it kind of at the beginning of quarantine and it took a lot of false turns and okay. is finally I think where it where it should be but it's super early and I don't I don't quite know where it's headed yet and then I also actually for the first time in my life have a back burner project that I'm like flipping to occasionally okay. so I don't and that's a historical fiction which is new to me and is really fun and juicy but also only has about 13,000 words written. So I'm trying this new thing where I'm occasionally toggling back and forth between them and I'm finding that really difficult. I don't know, Jenny, if you do that yet, but um, it, it's not, I think there's like, there's like a mental cost when I transition from one project to the other and I lose a lot of time in between. So I'm starting to realize that I need to do weeks at a time on one versus days, if that makes sense. No, I think it's tricky. I usually have like a book project and TV, different TV projects and I can juggle because there's a lot of gaps in time because there's so many people involved in TV. But with books, like this last, when I was finishing the sequel, it's all I could do. Like it's just okay. all, it just needs all yeah. that concentration. Are you, do you know what's next for you then, Jenny? Or anything on the table? Um, they are, I mean, Anna Kay was not written to be a series at all. It like, okay. I finished the book, but because it has, you know, an alternate ending than the real Anna Karenina. Um, it did give license for a sequel and they did, there was a lot of excitement, which I'm grateful for uh, about the first one. So then they did ask about a sequel and I was like, sure, without really thinking <laughs> it through. So I just turned in the first draft, but uh, so we'll see how that goes. So there what do you think Tolstoy would think of where you've taken the characters? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, honestly, like Tolstoy, I mean, it's so interesting because Tolstoy in the original, like, not that I, I don't think Tolstoy in any way like looked down on women, but like he definitely believed in women have their place in society and Anna was mm -hmm. wronged. I mean, did the wrong thing, made a mistake and she got what was coming to her basically, kind of in the end of his. It's a tragedy though. And I mean, because I think he, you know, so I don't know. I think I was very worried about like backlash from librarians and people who were like, what is she doing to our beloved book? But I love it so much myself. So I was hoping that that would be okay. Yeah. Well, that brings up an interesting point that I did want to ask um, you about Catherine and then also uh, Jenny, but Catherine, since Beatrice is the first, you know, in line as a woman to take the throne, was that like an important message to you, just women leadership? We have Nina's moms, you know, she also had a position um, higher up. Was that something you wanted to make sure was in there or? Absolutely. It's, I feel like when you're writing about an alternate or imagined world, it's impossible to do so without commenting on the real world, even in, in you know, a loose or indirect way. And as I said, I first started working on this book, or the very original version of it, you know, so long ago that I didn't have concrete ideas for any of the characters, really, except for Beatrice. And I I actually thought at the time, you know, I need to make sure this book comes out soon because eventually we'll, we'll get a female president pretty soon and this girl power message won't be so relevant. And I can't believe that here we are eight years later and it's just as relevant. So, um, so I, I do think it is, you know, it's obviously very, um, it's very important to me and, and very timely to be showing a young woman who is in power and is, and is basically the leader of America, even though, you know, it's a job that she has inherited. Um, it's also a job that she's trained for her whole life and feels very qualified for. And 
that's a lot of the conflict of book two is Beatrice trying to come into her own and men telling her that she can't and her having to go up against the establishment and prove that she deserves to have a voice and belong. Right. So in the yeah. reality of American Royals, like Beatrice is the very first female child who's been allowed to be um, the queen, right? This in your world. Yes, and in the real world, this actually didn't happen until 2013. This is just something that kind of felt flew under the radar because because the royals aren't actually the functioning executive in England. And you know, we as Americans don't get super excited about their laws of succession. But actually, up until 2013 in England, and there are still countries where male order succession is the order of the day. Monaco is one of them. Um, male children inherit over the female children, regardless of age. So up until that point, if a, if a female child was born and then she had a younger brother, the younger brother inherited over her. And then it was actually when Kate was pregnant for the first time, and they had not announced the gender of the baby that the British parliament decided to go ahead and pass this law because they realized that, you know, we're literally in deep into the, the 21st century at this point, and if she has a, a, a baby girl and then has a boy later, do they really want the son to inherit over the daughter? So, I mean, when I ask people how long ago they think that happened, people usually say like the 70s, they think that the queen did it with Charles, right. and I, I have to tell them, no, that literally happened within the last decade in the UK. So it's not actually that inconceivable that we would be living in the modern world and still have this edict in place. Hmm. All right. Well, kind of, let's see, switching gears a little bit. Um, Nick has a question. He says, would you say it is now more usual for adults to read more YA and YA like books? You think it's becoming more popular? I think it seems like it's becoming more popular, but I think adults have always read books for young people or books about young people. And that's, I, I'm always trying to get adults that I know or, or my friends to read more young adult because I think that there is unfortunately a sense among a lot of people that the books are only aimed at teenagers and that adults will have no appreciation for them. But if you look, I mean, young adult didn't exist as a category until the last 20 or 25 years. And if you look back at all the things that were asked to read in high school and you look at Romeo and Juliet or Great Expectations, or a lot of these character is is 14 or 18 and these are stories about coming of age and i think those are timeless stories and so and you know it doesn't matter how old you are you can appreciate a story about coming into adulthood figuring out who you are what you want from life falling in love for the first time those are those are classic stories and so now we're just sort of repackaging them and branding them for teenagers uh, but I think they have always existed in some form for adults. And I and I hope that adults will continue to read them because I think there is a place for them in your reading list, no matter how old you are. No, that's great. Jenny, do you have any thoughts on it? <laughs> um, yeah, sure. I mean, I always get that too, because uh, Anna Kay was my first young adult novel. And then they asked me about it. And I'm like, the characters in the story that I was conceiving in my head happened to be teenagers. So therefore it was classified as young adult. Like I wasn't setting out to write a young adult novel. I was just setting out to write this book. And so I found that interesting too, like what uh, Catherine's saying, because, you know, Catcher in the Rye would have been young adult, like back in the day. So, I mean, it's one of these books that everyone reads or in college and that you go back and everyone still watches teen movies. So to me, there was like a very blurring of the line between like, it should be kind of open. I know so many people, I think more women who are in their 20s and 30s have read Anna Kay than teenagers at this point, it's from what I can gather from who I, who's contacting me on Instagram. <laughs> Very cool. Um, well, speaking of writing for YA, I mean, do you guys have anything that kind of stands out, like why you enjoy it though, or you know, what kind of you know, led you to this genre, or what made you pursue writing in the first place? I feel like a cheater because I was working in young adult and editing those books. So I, I sort of knew the industry and, and, and didn't logically, I didn't even consider writing something that wasn't young adult. Um, I will say, I think young adult novels tend to be very hopeful in tone most of the time. Even the ones that deal with very heavy subject matter always end on a note of optimism 
or or inspiration and the belief that we can go out and make the world a better place. And you do sometimes find that in adult literature, but also sometimes adult literature can be a bit bleak for me. And so I, you know, I, I like my my books with a side of happiness, if possible. And I, I tend to find just a little bit more of that kind of energizing, um, you know, feeling and that optimism in the world of YA. Cool. Right. Um, all right, Jenny. What led you to? I guess were you just inspired by Anna K. Wine to tell that to kind of make the leap from television to start writing? Yeah. Uh, I loved, I read that when I was a teenager, Anna Karenina, so I've always loved it. But I saw that movie in 2012, the Kira Knightley version, and I was like, oh, it's really a story about first loves in like so many different directions, like the first big love you have. So I was like, oh, in modern day, that probably a lot of firsts, which I think is very appealing in young adult uh, fiction, you get to like the first love, the first kiss, the first heartbreak. There's so many first experiences and there's something so much extra like dramatic about it. Like that's not necessarily melodrama. It's just like the nature of the beast. The first time something happens, you're going to remember it more. So I feel like that's what's so exciting about young adult uh, fiction is that you get to like tell those first times. So I, I find it really fun. Cool. I know, um, Catherine, you mentioned who you root for, but Jenny, I wanted to circle back kind of as our last question. Do you have a relationship that you root for in American Royals more than others? Or <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I did like, I did, I thought Ethan and Daphne was kind of fun because, but I was like, Ethan's playing the long game. So I admired that about him. He knows what, he has Daphne's number. So I like that. So, and it's also fun to talk about it. Like it's, it is very clear world. I thought your characters were so well drawn. I really, it was funny because Samantha probably had the biggest leap of uh, of an, uh, you know, thing. Cause it was kind of tricky. Cause she was a little like, you know, yeah. rather like so like, oh, poor me. I don't know one pays attention to me. Mm -hmm. But then I really kind of, I found it very terrible. Like what the situation that happened with, um, not Connor, uh, who's the boy? Oh, Theodore, Teddy. I was just like, that's a terrible like thing that happened. Um, yeah, Sam became one of my favorite characters actually, kind of seeing her grow and then seeing her and her sister, um, you know, understand where the other one was at. So, yeah, it was definitely a fun read. Okay, so thank you both for being here tonight. Um, one thing that we do like to ask, um, kind of in addition to you know the books of the questions about um, the book on hand, is if you're reading anything else you know, currently, do you have um, what you're currently reading? Would you be able to share with us? We always like to hear from our authors. Um, yes, I, I'm i always reading a couple of things at once. Sure. So I, I'm usually reading a serious thing and then a not so serious thing. My, <laughs> my heavier thing, which is still really fun, is the biography of Queen Mary by James Pope Hennessy, which is just so dishy and delightful and very British and first was published in the 50s. And so it reads not like normal biographies. A chapter will open with something along the lines of, you know, we, we last met our heroine when she was vacationing with her family. Uh, you know, in Lake Como, and now she's here. So it almost reads like a Dickensian novel. It's really fun, and just just getting me like just more excited about all things royal. Um, and then I'm also reading Pretty Things by Janelle Brown, which is a really fun kind of contemporary thriller following a, a young woman who's trying to con an Instagram influencer in order to rob her. So I'm enjoying that one a lot right All now. Right. <laughs> All right, fun. Jenny, what are you reading? Since I just finished a deadline, when I'm really having the deadline, I can't read anything, but the book that I finished before that was The End of October by Lauren Strike about the pandemic, because I have a glutton for punishment and it was very dark and interesting. And then I am buddy reading for the second time, Infinite Jest. Um, because with a friend, he's a college student at Wesleyan. He's my ex-boyfriend's son. And we were like, oh, let's try to find a, a book to read together. And he had never read it. And I gave it to him for Christmas a couple years ago. He's like, let's do that. And I was like, oh, I'd already read it. But I was like, okay, let's do it. So we're doing 100 pages a week, which will take us 10 weeks because it's a 1,000 pages. But it's my husband's favorite book. So I feel like there's also a connection for that. 
That's cool. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, guys. And again, thank you for being here tonight um, and joining us. Thank you, viewers, for tuning in. Uh, your support's been what's keeping us going. And we hope you'll continue to shop online and attend more digital events like this one. Um, just want to remind everybody, you can, of course, still click the green button below to purchase your copy of American Royals and Jenny's book, Anna Kay, A Love Story. You can also shop our site online for other titles by the authors. And as an independent bookstore, we just want you to know we're so thankful for support from customers like you. And you can click the follow button on your screen to get notifications for other PMP Crowdcast events and check out our website for updated event listings. Um, as far as our children and teens department goes, you can follow us on social media under at Kids and Pros. And that's about it. Uh, Catherine or Jenny, did you guys have any uh, last words or last thoughts to share with us or? no just thank you so much for having us and no, yeah. um i can't wait to i feel like we're gonna have to talk again after you've read my second book because yeah. oh, there's, there's so much that's gonna change about all your opinions about all the characters so we'll let's go back in the fall okay well no, thank you again um viewers we hope to see you again at another event soon um just want to wish everyone well keep reading and have a good rest of your night. Thank you. Bye, everyone.